Well, good morning. It is a, a great pleasure and an honor to introduce this morning's keynote speaker, Dr. Rita Caldwell. Dr. Caldwell is a distinguished university professor at the University of Maryland and at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. She is senior advisor and chairman emeritus of Canon Life Sciences and global science officer and chairman of Cosmos ID Incorporated. She also serves as the United States Department of State Science Envoy with a focus on promoting opportunities for women and girls in science and STEM education. This is an extension of her broad interests in K-12 science and mathematics education, graduate science and engineering education, and the increased participation of women and minorities in science and engineering. Her research interests are focused on global infectious diseases, water and health, and the intersection of these with weather and climate. She is currently developing an international network to address emerging issues of infectious diseases and water, including safe drinking water for both developed and developing world, in collaboration with the Safe Water Network headquartered in New York City. Dr. Caldwell served, as you heard, uh, as the 11th director of the National Science Foundation from 1998 to 2004, and in that capacity was, and as NSF director, was the co-chair of the Committee on Science and uh, Technology Council. Uh, Dr. Caldwell held many advisory positions in the U.S. government, nonprofit uh, agencies, uh, and international scientific research community. She's authored 17 books and over 800 scientific papers. She produced the award-winning film Invisible Seas and served on the board of numerous editorial journals. Before going to NSF, Dr. Caldwell was president of the University of Maryland Biotechnology and in Biotechnology Institute and professor of microbiology and biotechnology here at the University of Maryland and a member of the National Science Board. Dr. Caldwell previously served as chairman of the board of the governors of the American Academy of Microbiology and president of the American Association for Advancement of Science, the Washington Academy of Sciences, the American Society for Microbiology, Sigma Psi National Honorary Society, the International Union of Microbiological Societies, and the American Institute of Biological Sciences. She's a member of the National Academy of Sciences, as you heard from Dr. Rees, but also the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, the Royal Society of Canada, the Royal Irish Academy, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the American Physiological Society, <laughs> Philosophical Society. She's been awarded 58 honorary degrees from institutions of higher education, including her alma mater, Purdue University, and is the recipient of the Order of the Rising Sun, Gold and Silver Star bestowed by the Emperor of Japan, and the 2006 National Medal of Science by the United President of the United States, and the 2010 Stockholm Water Prize awarded by the King of Sweden. She is an honorary member of microbiological societies in numerous countries and has held several honorary professorships, including one at Queensland, University of Queensland in Australia. And I find this of particular note. There's a geological site in Antarctica named the Caldwell Massif that has been named in recognition of her work in polar regions. We are very fortunate to have Dr. Caldwell with us today to keynote this morning's discussion of changing climate and health. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Milton. My dad would probably have liked to have heard that because he probably wouldn't believe it, but thank you very much. I really want to um, thank uh, Dr. Perlman and Dr. Reese uh, for working together um, and providing this wonderful collaboration between uh, University of Maryland College Park and, and University of Maryland at Baltimore. Indeed, I think the work that Dr. Clark has done in bringing this together at the School of Public Health and the um, opportunities and, of course, the many people that Dr. Magazina has explain to you who've been involved in this effort here at College Park as well as in Baltimore. I'd like to uh, point out that 
Just about everything that I'm going to describe today was done here at College Park and at the University of Maryland at Baltimore. We've interacted for the last uh, 30 or 40 years, uh, colleagues on both campuses. In fact, I'm very proud of the fact that a graduate of College Park, Jim Caper, is now the chair of microbiology at the University of Maryland at Baltimore and assistant to, to the dean of medicine. So it's clearly a wonderful partnership, and it could not be better to have the strengths of uh, atmospheric uh, physical sciences um, um, at the College Park, the computational capability, with the tremendous medicine advances being made in Baltimore. So what I'd like to discuss today is um, a lot of work that's been done. Let's see if I can get to, do I have the? It's, it's, it's open. It's open? OK. Technology gets you every time. Here we are. Thank you. Sure. Andrew's been my savior this morning. Um, I chose the um, quotation from Hippocrates because I think it's very appropriate. Whomever wishes to pursue the science of medicine must first investigate the seasons of a year and what occurs in them. That was in the fourth century BC, and it couldn't be more timely today. The um, water-related diseases uh, take a huge toll on uh, human populations. When you add up what occurs with uh, diarrheal diseases, um, including cholera that I'll be discussing in great detail, about one and a half billion cases every year, and at least 1.8 million deaths. And of course, I'll be discussing a bit of the situation in Haiti, uh, since we, as well, have been involved in some of those studies. But taking all of the diseases that are transmitted through unsafe water, it seems to me that providing safe water, good sanitation, and access to vaccines Really, those are the horsemen, not of the apocalypse, but the triage for public health globally. Now, cholera is a global disease. It's a water-related uh, diarrheal disease. It, it's described in pandemics because there seems to be waves of periods of time globally over the last several hundred years where the disease has become quite dominant. And the question is why? And I hope some of the uh, comments that I'll make today give you an insight into this relationship between the environment, the atmosphere, and populations, and sanitation, safety of water for populations. 50 countries today, so it's not a disease that's ancient, it's a disease that we really have to deal with right now. Unfairly, the Bengal Delta has been called the native homeland of cholera outbreaks. But uh, what I will describe to you is the fact that the disease actually is caused by a bacterium that <clears throat> occurs naturally in the environment and has a role to play in the cycling of nutrients in the environment. Cholera bacteria do exist in aquatic habitats, and we determined that by the work we did right here in Maryland in the Chesapeake Bay, way back when I started at the University of Maryland as my daughter says, a thousand years ago, Mom, but it was really only 1973, um, when we carried out our studies and showed that the bacterium, Vibrio cholerae, could be isolated from the Chesapeake Bay. But we don't have any epidemics because we have safe water and we have good sanitation. Now, we know that <clears throat> new biotypes are emerging, um, and we've been studying these. Um, the disease is considered to be caused by the serotype O1. But a few years ago, a new serotype became pandemic. And that, uh, the 0139, uh, is still a problem in parts of the world. But since then, variants on the classical strains have occurred. And the interesting thing is that this can be geographically associated. So there seems to be a lot of evidence building now that the bacterium is naturally occurring um, in, the, in the environment. Now, 
it, the bacterium is a small uh, curved rod with a single flagellum that allows it to propel itself through aquatic systems. It's isolated on a selective medium, and the yellow colonies are quite characteristic. This is a biosulfate, bile salts medium. But the cartoon that I show is from the New York Times, 50, let's see, 1850 or 1860. And there it shows cholera, the specter, coming into New York Harbor because the belief was that it came from somewhere else. And the warrior asleep on the dock has a belt that says science. And the New York Times is uh, berating scientists for not doing something about cholera coming into New York. Well, in fact, cholera and many other infectious diseases were rampant in Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. was the hotbed of, in the summer months, of typhoid fever, of malaria, uh, of cholera. And in, up until 1890, these diseases were believed to have been caused by bad air or miasma. So Washington was known as a miasmic swamp. Well, some people think it still is, but <laughs> different reasons, different reasons. Um, the, um, the disease itself, let me just go back. Um, this is where we had some problems. Andrew, where are you when I need you? Um, the disease is global. Um, in fact, um, though we have spent most of our time um, de considering the uh, native homeland um, of Africa, this is the same problem we had earlier. Yeah. No, I'm not going to be able to get that. I'm not sure. Well, let's just go back. Okay. Um, we're supposed to make the earth move, but obviously I'm not succeeding in make the earth move this morning. But. <laughs> This is supposed to rotate and show you that um, the disease is global. Right now, Africa is probably the, suffering the most um, of the devastation of cholera in the sub-Saharan Africa region. But some years ago, the outbreaks of cholera occurred in Latin America, in Peru, and uh, 1991 to 92, it spread uh, throughout um, uh, Latin America. And then, of course, most of our work is being done in Bangladesh. Now, the relationship is to the temperature of the water, the sea surface temperature, which can be measured by satellite. It's also related uh, to the factors of um, um, tidal flow and tidal um, uh, events. And this is, uh, these are NASA um, uh, photos taken uh, over a 10-year period downloaded and showing you the changes, but fundamentally the relationship really comes down to that of plankton. And um, the relationship between the, the zooplankton is what we had determined here at the University of Maryland. Now, what I'm summarizing is about 40 years work, namely that the bacterium, upper left, um, is associated with and the natural component of the flora of that little critter, the copepod, shown here. And it, it's a component of its um, gut flora and surface, but it's also the source of food for shellfish um, and for crustaceans like the blue crab. What happens, of course, is that in areas of the world where sanitation is very poor, person-to-person -person transmission, the traditional epidemiology is very powerful, and clearly that occurs, but the source is really the environment. And again, this composite really is work done here at College Park, uh, in the Chesapeake Bay, but also in Dhaka, Bangladesh, where we have worked over the last 30, 35 years. Now, the, the macro-scale processes become fascinating because we know that rainfall has, a, is, has an effect on, on cholera and other waterborne diseases. Flooding plays a major role, particularly in Bangladesh, where in the spring there's uh, an epidemic, and again in the fall a major epidemic. In the spring, the work that we have done shows that it's related to drought and the low li uh, river le levels. In the fall, it's related to the monsoons and the heavy flooding. Salinity is a major factor because one of the big surprises was that the cholera bacterium is a marine estuarine bacterium. In fact, it abounds, can be isolated in countries like Iceland, where there has never been cholera. 
One of our students here at College Park did a Fulbright in Iceland, Brad Haley. He's now postdocing at the USDA. But he showed uh, in work there that he could isolate it from where uh, the geothermal temperature uh, of the water was higher, and he could isolate their real cholera. But Iceland has never had a case of cholera, and they trace the infectious diseases back to the settlement of Iceland. And in fact, now they're doing some very interesting genomic work because the population uh, uh, records are so powerful. So the bacterium is naturally occurring. Some strains are bioluminescent. Some strains cycle nitrogen. Um, some strains um, will cycle carbon. It's in fact, all of the vibrios, vibrio cholerae and the related pathogens, vibrio periemoticus, have a capacity to degrade chitin and acetylglucosamine polymer, which is what you know when you eat crabs and you peel the shell away, that shell is the chitin. All vibrios degrade chitin because of the relationship um, with their natural host. Now, I'll focus on the, in the discussion in the Bay of Bengal, where we've done most of our work over the past um, 30 or 40 years. And having shown you that there's a relationship with plankton, it occurred to us that we could use satellite imagery and sensing to monitor the environment for the conditions that will be conducive to cholera. So 20 years ago, it occurred to us, well, look, satellites allow the sensing and measurement of chlorophyll. They also allow measuring uh, temperature and sea surface height. Let's put these together and with a correction from the phytoplankton with chlorophyll serving as food, hypothesis, serving as food for the zooplankton, which then will bloom, we should theoretically find that the relationship is strong subsequently to the shedding of all the vibrios as the zooplankton population decreases because it's used up the phytoplankton food. So that's about four to six weeks. And we did the calculation, and it was to our surprise. This is an early uh, publication from the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. The red are the cholera cases in Bangladesh in MATLAB, and the blue is the sea surface temperature. The correlation was very surprising because essentially you're measuring by satellite miles up the chlorophyll, and you're counting patients coming in to the hospital with cholera in Bangladesh. We have improved the model to the point where in Calcutta and in, in uh, Bangladesh, Matla, Bangladesh, which is near the major city of Dhaka, the correlation between cases and the environmental signatures were very, very powerful to the point where for a milligram per cubic meter increase in chlorophyll concentration measured by satellite, we can see a third increase, 33% increase in cholera cases in Bangladesh. And for a millimeter per day increase in rainfall, we can see a 7% increase in the number of cholera cases. And this holds in Bangladesh and Calcutta, India. So this relationship is very powerful. We now have been able to separate epidemic cholera, which occurs with many years of very little or no cholera, and suddenly explosion of cholera, as occurs in Delhi, India, which is inland, opposed to what occurs every year, spring and fall, epidemics along the coast, where tidal flow feeds in the plankton, and the conditions are such that with flooding and the monsoon effects, we've been able to separate these characteristic epidemic cholera and endemic. In fact, to provide the powerful evidence, we went back to all of the data available from colonial India, which are resident in these huge maps the size of these tables in the Museum of Natural History in London. And my colleague, Elizabeth Whitcomb, a physician who did a PhD first in India on hydrology of the country, and then a medical degree in New Zealand, she's a Kiwi, but has worked mostly in London practicing medicine. The collaboration was that we were able to get all of the data from about 1823 to 1948 into the computer, thanks to her good work and the collaboration with the uh, London um, uh, team, for 
the coastal areas and for the central areas. And in the central areas, we did initial focus around Delhi because there, Delhi shows years without much um, cholera and all of a sudden massive explosive epidemics. And the correlation was fascinating by putting on, into the computer all of the data on temperature and rainfall. We found that characteristically, a couple of months of very hot weather followed by very heavy rainfall coupled with an event of a religious gathering of people so that you had a combination of what we call above average temperature, air temperature, because that's all we could measure from the historical records, and a very heavy rainfall above average, damaged, poor, or overstressed sanitation system, high risk of cholera. Could we have predicted the Haitian cholera epidemic? Well, it's, this epidemic clearly points to us that this disease remains a global threat, and we've developed a framework for being able to understand cholera, and we have a very pragmatic framework, and we've published uh, a number of papers on this work done in collaboration initially with Tufts University School of um, Engineering, uh, where they are specialists in hydrology and water uh, conditions and water engineering. And uh, the student who did his PhD there, Anta Jutla, came to Maryland to do a postdoc. He's now a professor at the University of West Virginia, but we have continued collaborations. Now, in Haiti, there was this massive epidemic in 2010, but first, in 2010, in January, there was this huge, devastating earthquake, Richter scale of 7.6. And then subsequently, in the fall, around October, there was an outbreak with a presumed source of the epidemic in the inner region of Haiti and ascribed by some to the Nepal peacekeeping uh, soldiers who were brought in to assist because of the earthquake. And there had been two years earlier an epidemic or an outbreak of cholera in Nepal. However, the soldiers had never tested positive. In any case, the disease affected Haiti in a very, very rapid way. All along the coast, as well as inland, simultaneously. Now the calculations on river flow uh, by uh, Dr. Judla and colleagues, Dr. Akanda and uh, Dr. Islam, their professor at Tufts, was that the flow of the river simply was not fast enough to be able to have seeded the entire island. Now, what we were able to do was obtain samples uh, within the first two weeks of that massive epidemic from about 80 patients. This is thanks to Dr. Prosper, a wonderful Haitian physician with whom we collaborated, and the team at Maryland in the School of Public Health where studies were being done by the team on sanitation prior to the, the, uh, the earthquake and the epidemic. We had been collaborating with them, so we already had those contacts. We downloaded, or I should say Anta and uh, uh, Ali Akanda, downloaded, downloaded all of the data for the past 60 years, all that were available, on temperatures in Haiti and on rainfall. Interestingly, the air temperature in Haiti, in red on the left, higher than, than it had been in 60 years for that, that was the hottest summer that followed the earthquake in the spring, the hottest summer in record, and then a hurricane skirted the island in late October, and it was the heaviest rainfall in 60 years. It was the perfect storm, and the pattern fit precisely which we had determined historically for the work and the data in India. Now, there's also the genomic aspect of it. I've been discussing satellites measuring from, from outer space, but now let's go to the molecular level. Here again at the University of Maryland, back in 2000, Dr. John Heidelberg did his PhD in the laboratory here at Maryland. He moved to Tiger, the Institute for Genomic Research, which is now the Venter Institute, to do the sequencing uh, as a postdoc. So we collaborated 
here at Maryland, Tiger and John Megalanos at Harvard, and we published the first full sequence of a cholera bacterium. And we, con we uh, actually uh, proved what Jim Caper, using classical genetics, had suggested there were two chromosomes. And indeed, for the first time, because until then, all bacteria had been assumed to have a single chromosome. The uh, Vibrio cholerae, and now it's been shown that all Vibrios, Miramonis, and, and a variety of other bacteria do have two chromosomes. Not all, but, but, but at least some, particularly those that are of a dual nature, environmental and a human pathogen as well. So we have a large chromosome and a small chromosome. We know that the small chromosome is not a big plasmid because when you cure some of the metabolic functions, the bacterium doesn't, uh, cannot divide. So the small chromosome carries some very important housekeeping genes. We have since, here at the University of Maryland, sequenced over 150 in that original study published in the Proceedings of the Natural Academy, National Academy of Science, showing that when you take strains of cholera from throughout the world, Sudan, um, from the Chesapeake Bay, from uh, Bangladesh, from India, from Kenya, that there's a relationship, 98 to 100 percent sequence, um, base pair by base pair, but none are absolutely identical. This is very interesting because we're now doing work and writing up work from Bangladesh where we have taken isolates from different ponds from which the people take their water for drinking and also sequencing, we're in the process now here in Maryland of sequencing over the strains that we've collected over the last <clears throat> 10 years from patients to do a molecular epidemiology. And the evidence is very strong <clears throat> that different strains from different ponds cause the outbreaks, cause the disease in the patients uh, in Bangladesh. In any case, from Haiti, from those samples, we were able to show that out of the 81 stool samples, 41, <coughs> excuse me, indeed, provided or we could isolate the Vibrio cholerae 01 epidemic strain, but from 20 of the stool samples, we isolated only non-01 strains. And in fact, some we isolated only Aeromonas. Now subsequently, it's been shown by another investigator because it had been stated boldly that cholera had never been in Haiti prior to 2010 outbreak. But a recent paper appeared in which it had been discovered stored stool samples of a study in 2008 of diarrheal disease were available and were reassessed and re-examined and Vibrio cholerae was isolated. So it indeed had been present in, um, thank you, had been present um, in Haiti prior to the earthquake, prior to the ma massive epidemic. And then even more interesting is the fact that in Haiti, subsequently, again, team of students from the University of Maryland, Arlene Chen and Brad Haley and the team in the lab, were able to re-isolate because the Centers for Disease Control asked us to join them. And we have just published a paper showing that you can isolate the non-01 Vibrio cholerae throughout the island. And we can also isolate uh, the O1. And, and uh, Glenn Morris, who was at the University of Maryland and now runs an institute in Florida, his team has established a lab in Haiti and we've been able to isolate uh, the bacteria. They've been able to isolate the bacteria. The phylogenomics shown here um, indicate that the green collection of strains that we've sequenced form a separate clade. And uh, by principal component analysis, it's very interesting, in the encircled area, the one blue dot that is shown in the Haitian cluster cloud is a strain from Kenya. So I think we need, as we have said in a subsequent proceedings of the National Academy of Science publication, it is more complicated than to simply say the disease was introduced. The environment played a role, perhaps the introduction uh, may have been significant, I don't deny that, but overall 
I think we need to take into account the multi-dimensional nature of this waterborne disease. Uh, and the conclusion based on the genomic analysis is that there are sufficient um, polymorphisms, uh, nucleotide deletions, uh, uh, repeats that indicate that the Haitian cluster strain is unique in its own right. Now, it, we have gone on to do some work here in Maryland to understand the metagenomics. Because one of the studies that uh, I will show you some data that we have discovered, and I think we need, and I'm, I'm delighted that Dean Reese and President Perlman is still here because I want you to hear this message. The work that we have done in studying uh, cholera patients in Calcutta work in collaboration with the then director, Dr. Ramamurthy. They provided 50 patient clinical samples, stool samples, from which they isolated the DNA plus 10 controls. These are cohorts, family cohorts, or community cohorts without symptoms of a disease. They then did 26 tests for everything from Salmonella, Shigella, rotavirus, cryptosporidium, et cetera. And we simply got the blinded DNA. And I'll show the data in a minute, but the point I want to make is that each of those patients carried four to 10 pathogens. I think we need to revisit Koch's postulates, assigning a single pathogen as the source of the infection. I think in this era of metagenomics, we need to understand the community of the flora and the community of pathogens uh, in the extreme cases of disease. And I'm delighted to say that um, we are collaborating with Dr. Viscardi, University of Maryland, to do studies of neonates. And now I'll describe the method that we have developed here at Maryland for isolating uh, and identifying right down to species and strain. We have developed a, a, a solution. Let me go back to, yeah. We've developed a, an algorithm because here at Maryland we have a tremendous computer science department and the Institute for Advanced Computer Studies, some brilliant people who work very well with very large databases. And again, that's a collaboration between the two campuses. So we have developed very highly curated databases for about 7,000 bacteria. We're working on the total set of 31,000, which we'll have completed by the end of the year. We have a database for fungi, about six or 700 strains, also for all the DNA viruses, and we're working on the RNA viruses, and by the end of the year, we'll have all of the major pathogens, parasite pathogens, in our database. We use the entire genome, tens of thousands of biomarkers, and we identify down to strain and substrain. 16S is very inaccurate. I may or may not have time to go into that, but nevertheless, we go down right to strain. And this is important because in E. coli, all of us in this room have E. coli in our gut. We're fine. They're commensals. They produce vitamins, and they protect against potential pathogens that we might ingest, whereas the pathogenic E. coli are pretty bad. They, uh, there are a variety of pathotypes and serotypes that cause uh, very severe diarrhea, disease diarrhea, and it's a killer. Um, those who ingested hamburgers that uh, carried one of the serotypes of E. coli uh, can attest to the fact that it's a dangerous pathogen. So it's important to know strain and substrain. So the technique is to extract the DNA, as we did with the stool samples from Calcutta, then to use the extracted DNA um, sequence, which is being done here on the campus, uh, and then extracting uh, using the raw sequence reads and then doing a match against our libraries that we have highly curated for all of these strains for the full sequences. The matching is done mathematically within minutes and it's done with a server and a laptop working right here on the campus. And the probabilistic matching is Bayesian. We can identify the bacteria and then we 
run them through, uh, again, a, another algorithm for matching against antibiotic resistance and virulence factors. And that allows us then to, with the identified bacteria, to determine in the given sample how much of each of the strains or species is present in that sample, what they are, and what genes they carry for antibiotic resistance and for pathogenicity traits. The applications are very wide for human, of course, for medicine, but also food safety, for environmental uh, safety, and for bio threats uh, analysis. And we're doing work with um, some of the agencies. Again, this is a, a business diagram because it was a lot easier to get funding by starting a company, and that is something that the university uh, endorses. And so Cosmos ID is a Maryland-generated company, um, and this allows us to do informatic analysis of clinical specimens. So let me show you some of the data of the diarrheal patients from Calcutta compared with the metagenome of, by us downloading, by our downloading from the NIH database for the human microbiome, the gut flora of normal uh, Americans. And here you can see the samples, uh, accumulated samples. In the upper left are the diarrheal patients, where these samples had been sent to us, the DNA which we analyzed. They had found multiple pathogens, told us what they were. We, after we told them what we found, and the match was very good. Um, but the point that I want to make is that not only is Vibrio cholerae represented in the pink area, but there are other pathogens, Salmonella, Shigella, um, Rotavirus, Giardia. In the upper right were the samples they sent us that they couldn't isolate using culture techniques, and we were able to identify without any difficulty the pathogens. Then they could go back and do PCR and retest and confirm the findings that we had done simply by analyzing the, D the DNA sequence with no culture needed, simply taking the DNA extracted, sequencing it, and then applying the algorithms. This, this, the quickest part is the algorithm analysis because the, the time to extract and to sequence is about eight to 10 hours. The time to analyze is about 10 minutes. Now at the bottom <clears throat> to the left are the healthy controls from Calcutta. Notice that they do show, these, this, these compiled samples show a large pink area. Those are pathogens. These are healthy individuals. On the lower right are the uh, NIH data for the human microbiome, healthy individuals. Very, very thin sliver because some of us do carry pathogens that don't make us sick. And I suspect, this is purely hypothesis, I suspect that this is a mechanism for constantly sort of triggering the immune system to maintain immune protection. Now, the multiple pathogens are readily identified from the disease patients. In fact, just by matching up um, on the left-hand side, side the, the uh, screen for known enteric pathogens, we're able to identify in the, from here, from this point, these are patients, uh, diarrheal patients, and you can see the wide mix of pathogen um, identifications, whereas that uh, HMP, that uh, vertical set, uh, shows that, yes, some of us do carry pathogens, but very few compared to uh, India. Now, one other point that I would like to make, if I could, I guess I can go back. Uh, one point I would like to make is that uh, it was very clear that um, from, from the uh, Venn diagrams that the Western upper right, um, uh, I'm sorry, the Western lower right compared to the uh, gut flora of healthy individuals in the lower left allows the differentiation through metagenomics of those from India with a different diet from those from the Western hemisphere. So that becomes an identification uh, uh, capability. And then my final example is an outbreak work done with the University of Virginia where a problem had arisen with multi multiple antibiotic resistant uh, in 
infectious agent, and it was suspected that it was derived from a biofilm in the sinks. So scrapings from the sink trap were provided. We did uh, next generation sequencing, that is we extracted the DNA and uh, did the analysis, and we were able to show that their identification resistant, we were able to identify the uh, antibiotic resistant uh, bacterial strains present in the biofilms, and we were able to identify them right down to uh, species and strain, and the relative abundance, the dark red means those are the ones that were abundant in that biofilm, and we were able also to show from the antibiotic resistant factor bearing strains, we could even identify those resistance features associated with plasmids. So we were able to characterize the biofilm, and this is done without any culturing, but simply using the DNA and being able to trace and track um, the antibiotic resistance. This technique is about 10,000 times faster than BLAST. We've been, uh, been tested against Metaplan, Kraken, and all of the other uh, algorithms that are available. None can identify to species and strain, and the technique that we've developed here at Maryland can do that. So um, I'm going to close with just one last um, uh, example of why we feel so strongly about what we do. I have described high tech. I've described using satellites. I've described to you using molecular genetics. What can this do, all of this information, to help the villagers of rural Bangladesh who have given to us because they've been essentially the source of the studies that we have done? Hypothesizing that these copepods, which carry the Vibrio cholerae as part of their natural flora, they're kind of the elephants of the microscopic world. They're about 280 micrometers. The bacteria are uh, maybe 10 to 20 micrometers. So if we could just filter out the copepods and the particulate matter, which traps the bacteria, this would be a simple technique that would reduce cholera. So we were able to get funding from the NIH, and again, for the students in the audience, there's another, um, let's say, a message here, in that the NIH proposal we submitted to NIAID, and the reviewers said, no way. This is not going to be successful because no man in Bangladesh is going to drink water that has been filtered through a seri cloth because we had determined that the simplest filter was old used seri cloth, folded about four or five times. So we went back to the drawing board. We were able to get a, a contract or a grant from the Thrasher Foundation to do a test. It was $100,000, a three-month study. Well, what we discovered was that men had been using seri cloth to filter flies from their beer. <laughs> so when you get a review, revise and resubmit. So we resubmitted it, but the NIAID said, this is not very technical. So they translate, they, they, they handed it over, they lateraled it to the Nursing Institute. The Nursing Institute funded it. Thank you, Nursing Institute of NIH. <laughs> and we did a three-year study using hiring women to be our extension agents, just like we have for agricultural extension agents here in the US, who went out every week to teach the women how to filter the water that they were collecting each morning for their families. And it didn't take a whole lot of convincing because on the right-hand side, you can see the water post-filtration and pre-filtration. And we were able to explain with charts and diagrams that we had ed educated the, the, the women extension agents to explain to the women in the village because they're the ones that collect the water that this is not good for your children's health. So it was very easy to, to show, and we were able to reduce cholera by 50%. And there, there's a nylon mesh that's available that's used against a dracunculiasis, which is also a copepod-transmitted uh, disease in Africa. But that's very expensive, uh, and it wasn't even as effective as just folding seri cloth and using that to filter. So I close by pointing out that when one tugs at a single thing in nature, he, and I would add and she, finds it hitched to the rest of the universe. The words of John Muir 
the founder of the Sierra Club. And I would love, I love thanking all of my students, the collaborators from the International Center for Diarrheal Disease Bangladesh, from Calcutta, India, University of Maryland students, postdocs, visiting scientists, collaborators from, in, uh, from NASA Ames, with whom we worked, and NASA here uh, at, uh, in, in Maryland, uh, colleagues, postdocs, visiting scientists from other countries, uh, colleagues, um, even colleagues from uh, the intelligence agencies with whom we have been doing some work, and special acknowledgement to the team with whom we developed the algorithms that we now uh, make available. By the way, the algorithm is available on uh, free on the, the Illumina uh, base space cloud, and you can just submit your shotgun sequence and do analysis, get in touch with us, we'll assist with any problems. And then poor people really deserve special, special mention. My colleague of many, many years, student at College Park, did his PhD, went back to Bangladesh, headed up the clinical lab, brought him back to Maryland to work, and he is now a professor at the university. Antara Jutla, who's been fantastic in doing the, the uh, climate and weather related studies, uh, Hassan, who does everything, he's, he's a sequencer, uh, informaticist, and brilliant, and again, uh, has done his work at College Park. Sion Young Choi, a bioinformaticist, originally from Korea, did her PhD with a former postdoc from here in Maryland, who now is the head of the department at the Seoul National University. And so I think we can all be proud that we are doing something here at Maryland through what is now a wonderful School of Public Health, joined at the hip and the head and the heart with our colleagues in Baltimore. And we're doing the best we can to change this so that everybody has a right to safe water and good health. Thank you.